everyone. This is Senator Saud Anwar. Uh, recently, I had uh, some interesting conversations. Um, this include people who were very concerned about the November election, and they were afraid of uh, um, uptick or increase in the case of uh, COVID-19 uh, infections. And then I had another conversation with somebody who was very much concerned about uh, election and the risks associated with uh, having mail-in ballots. So I wanted to have a discussion about absentee ballots, um, about the vo vote by mail and mail-in voting. We actually use these terms interchangeably. Um, and I wanted to look at data before we uh, make any decisions, before people have concerns. So I put some of my thoughts and, and uh, um, evidence uh, and information that is available uh, about this topic. So uh, first question is, can we protect our health while selecting our candidates this November? And the answer to that is yes, we should and we must and, and, and protecting our health will be a priority and making sure that we participate in the election is going to be a priority for us as well. So why mail-in voting now um, is another question. Uh, it's it's uh, important to realize the pandemic and the current status. We uh, know from uh, the experts, Dr. Fauci has been very clear that uh, the virus will remain an issue uh, in this fall, will remain a concern. If you look at majority of the states in the, well, a significant part of the states in our country, uh, the virus remains a big threat and it's increasing in uh, certain uh, states. Uh, we have a concern that there would be uh, a risk of um, a second wave. CDC director has warned about it. Uh, many of the experts around the world have uh, warned about it. So it's a smart idea to have a preparation in place to prevent this from occurring. And if uh, it is going to occur, we need to prevent the propagation or increase of the impact of this disease. Um, has some something that we can learn from the situation? Yes, we can. Uh, if you remember uh, around April beginning, the April, there was uh, um, in uh, the uh, case of uh, um, people being a part of the uh, um, uh, polling, um, poll workers, uh, people who came out to vote, uh, they were uh, impacted uh, by the COVID infection. Some 67 people in a matter of a few uh, couple of weeks were infected and then actually started to go up. And the uh, earlier slide was uh, uh, discussing that very aspect as well. So um, that is why I think it, it's important to have a plan of action and prevention in place. So what do we know about uh, mail-in uh, voting? Well, we do know a few things. If you look at uh, the data, uh, we have uh, uh, the mail-in voting has been gradually increasing in our um, country across the board. Uh, the number of cases of uh, uh, mail-in absentee voting has been increasing. If you look at the pattern, it's been gradually increasing uh, over time. And that's something that we can uh, see clearly. And, and uh, the voting on uh, the election day voting has been gradually decreasing. Now, in our state of Connecticut, we have not seen that because we have very restrictive policies around this topic, and, and we need to address that in more detail. Uh, we do know uh, that uh, mail-in voting is nothing new. This actually dates back all the way to uh, the time of the Civil War where the first absentee voting for both Union and Confederate soldiers did occur. Absentee ballot uh, laws uh, for civilians who were uh, with serious illness, who were away from home, uh, came in the late 1800s. And then in 1942 and 44 during the World War, uh, Congress had passed laws related to the soldiers uh, stationed overseas during World War I. So essentially from the Civil War on to the current times, we have had these laws. So this is nothing new. This is nothing novel that uh, we have never experienced and people have not used before. Um, there are a number of uh, states that have actually been uh, uh, exclusively using mail-in vote method. The five of them are there, which is uh, the state of Washington, the Oregon, Utah, and Colorado, and Hawaii have been actually essentially using uh, default voting by mail. Uh, and that actually gives us a pretty good data about uh, the benefits that they have achieved, the outcomes uh, with respect to uh, participation and and also the risks that we are concerned about uh, of voter fraud. So there's a lot of data around that and that's actually worthy to look at it. 
Um, the challenge is that we have other states where um, there are people who can vote uh, absentee in many of the states, um, but there are excuse requirements. Excuses are required in the state of Connecticut, but they are somewhat restrictive excuses. That that's part of uh, um, the concern that people have for this November, how things would uh, uh, work out if uh, we do not have a very focused uh, uh, expansion on the excuse that is there or uh, even have a universal mail-in uh, voting opportunity that can be. So who can make the changes in the law that oversee them? That's straightforward. Each state uh, legislature by the uh, constitution, the elections clause, uh, gives us the re responsibility to address this. So easy, even for the legislature there of May Direct uh, for the number of electors for the president. So the state legislature has the authority and should uh, take up this authority responsibility around this. Uh, we also need to uh, be reminded of uh, the 14th Amendment where the rights of all qualified citizens to vote in state as well as in federal election is something that we need to protect and make sure that it's ensured and they have an opportunity that it's counted. Um, so we have a responsibility to make sure we uh, help this process out. Is this political? Unfortunately, it is. If, if you recently uh, see uh, President Trump uh, had uh, uh, had this uh, tweet which made a lot of, uh, um, uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, he talked about uh, the mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. So he felt it was going to be fraudulent and uh, people will be robbed of ballots will be forged and illegally printed and fraudulently signed. This was all that was said at uh, uh, through his uh, tweet. The important thing is that uh, right off the bat, uh, Twitter had actually said uh, to get the facts about mail ballots and then Twitter made uh, uh, their statement about they added two uh, tweets from California by mail plans that uh, uh, President Trump had uh, tweeted about. Uh, there was a, a correction and the data and information that was uh, uh, shared and it was felt it was ups uh, unsubstantiated uh, remarks and I think that's uh, something that led to a lot of attention globally where Twitter was fact checking the president for the first time. But it is, um, and uh, the Republican National Committee had sued California to halt vote by mail for November general election. Uh, this is uh, from uh, CNN, uh, where uh, it was uh, clear that uh, there is a war that looming, and we know that the Republicans have planned to spend about 20 million, uh, this is public information, uh, and uh, combat voting rights lawsuits in 2020. Uh, this is going across the board. Lawsuits are being planned. And, and this is something that people are concerned about from the, the Republican side that um, would the laws be uh, not followed? Would there be something that may harm the election outcome from their narrative or their perspective? Uh, and I think it's, it's important to go through the details and see uh, what the data and the research shows around the aspect. This is actually just a picture of the RNC uh, suing the uh, Secretary of State for uh, California. Uh, this is the lawsuit that we were talking about. Um, it is worthy to read it. Uh, um, there are some of the uh, parts that are going to be relevant to my, my conversation uh, going forward. So, uh, so we know it's political. We know there are concerns. We, we know that uh, at least one political party has very serious uh, concerns about this and they want to stop this from happening. Uh, at least that's their public position and uh, private position and the legal position in many of the states, if not all of the states. Um, does it need to be political? And that's something I think we need to look at. Uh, I think in all of the lawsuits uh, we talk about, uh, uh, so not all, at least the California lawsuit, we talk about uh, building confidence in the U.S. election. This was actually a, a report of the Commission on Federal Election Reform. Uh, this was a commission that was uh, co-chaired by uh, President Jimmy Carter and James Baker. Um, this was back in 2005, a very thorough detailed report that was provided actually has spent a lot of information on vote by mail. And then some of this information is used in the lawsuit. But I, I want to get your attention to the fact that there is data and there are concerns that have been mentioned. The concerns are without data and, and frankly after this report was done, 
this was the recommendation on vote by mail. And I, I want everybody to remain focused on this because this report is going to be used by many people as an argument that uh, we should not have vote by mail. But the recommendation of the report was that it encouraged further research of the pros and cons of vote by mail and of early voting. So I think that's what was uh, said finally after looking at the pros and cons of various aspects that we need more research. And this is back in 2005. And thankfully, since that time, there has been uh, appropriate level of research that has been this topic. Another uh, thing that you'll uh, hear is uh, from Dr. Morley, uh, Michael Morley, uh, who's a Florida uh, State University College of Law professor. Um, he wrote about election emergency red lines. He also um, has looked at a number of data, uh, some individual anecdotes, and then highlighted those anecdotes. Um, but his conclusion was essentially that they must, we must, in these current times and uh, with the pandemic, uh, we must not only identify the most effective courses of action to take, but particularly problematic alternatives that can be avoided. Again, after all of his research, all of his data, he said, well, the most effective thing is what we have to do, and we have to try and avoid problems. And, and I think that's a, a way to approach this as well. So these two um, Articles have been used heavily in the lawsuit um, by the RNC in, in California, and, and the data that is in the information and, and the links through these articles are what are being uh, propagated as uh, concerns that there are. I think it's, it's worthy to look at a recently published data on April uh, in 2020 that was actually the neutral partisan effects of vote by mail. And I think this is a very important study by the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, where they had uh, come up with, the, uh, after a detailed in-depth study on the impact of vote by mail, uh, what was identified was that vote by mail does not appear to affect either party's share of turnout. So it does not impact one party's turnout over the other. It does not increase the number of uh, vote share of uh, parties, and but it does increase the overall turnout. So this it should give some comfort to people who are concerned that this is make this this entire strategy of vote by mail is going to help more pe more Democrats versus Republicans or vice versa. In reality, the studies are showing that it does not impact one party versus the other. So that should be comforting for everybody who wants the par the the elections to be fair and then uh, one party does not have an edge rather for that purpose. Another very interesting thing is that if we look at the percentage of uh, 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 absentee ballots that are used in various states and, and many of the states are doing very well with, with the, for example, Arizona, uh, which has a Republican governor and Republican legislator, there's there about 61, 60% of their ballots are uh, done by absentee ballot, which is pretty, uh, impressive that that's doing happening uh, in the state of Connecticut we are way behind and, and and this is something that we will have to have internal conversation as a state that why are we so much behind in many other parts of this the the country and then can we come together to to look at the experiences of our peers in other states and and, and see if there's an opportunity to uh, move forward Florida uh, Republican governor, Republican legislature, and, and they are 25% in that range. And I think this is an age factor. And in many of these states, as the populations are aging much more, uh, that's uh, a requirement has uh, been that people need to have more absentee ballot for increased uh, participation. Idaho, again, Republicans, and then they have uh, a significant uh, uh, participation through absentee ballot. Indiana is similar as well. Um, I've not talked about Oregon because they already have a law which requires them to do it. I've not talked about uh, um, the other state, for example, Washington state, because they already have a law that requires everybody to go that way. But Utah has uh, 69 and now 89 percent already. That's uh, pretty impressive. Wyoming is again on the higher side as well. So we're seeing a pattern across the the country where um, you see patterns for both parties to be using it, but Republicans are Republican control legislature have uh, been experienced and have had uh, perpetually been reelected as well. So I think the concerns that have been raised in the recent uh, year are not necessarily substantiated based on the data and the experience that's out there from actual research. I think that's something worthy for my, my colleagues and everybody to look at. 
does mail-in ballot increase voter fraud? I think this is one of the concerns that a lot of people have had, and that's what is voiced, and that is at least what is used to try and shy away from this policy. So um, if we look at the data from the existing four, uh, four, four or five states, we have uh, information. There were 54 suspected vote fraud cases that emerged in Oregon. And then this is uh, what uh, they found out uh, the, the probability was uh, 0.002 percent of votes cast in Oregon, according to the Secretary Dennis Richardson, who is a highest-ranking Republican, his perspective was, and he did not uh, uh, say that they were non-citizens who were voting. It was actually suspicious cases that were identified, and his perspective finally was that one out of every 38,000 ballots. Now think this through for a second. One out of every 38,000 ballots were. Uh, with some uh, fraud uh, uh, concern that they had, which comes to 0.002%. Um, and Washington State had a similar study. There were 74 cases, and that also came down to 0.002% uh, of the cases, which is very important to um, look at. Uh, so this sort of panned out that, yes, there is a risk, but the risk is in the 0.02%. And if you put it in perspective, it is uh, uh, more likely an individual is more likely to be hit by lightning 12 times in their lifetime than to be involved in a voter fraud by mail-in voting. So again, hit by lightning throughout their lifetime multiple times rather than be involved in uh, fraud by mail-in voting. And that actually puts the probabilities in perspective from real uh, so we can actually make objective decisions and uh, educated decisions on where we are. Is this an issue in the state of Connecticut? Has the absentee voter fraud history in Connecticut? We do need to look at this. I think um, Gail Barrett uh, and, and, and his team, Elisa Trachtenberg, uh, uh, had written uh, this uh, very good article, in, including Jonathan Perlow, um, in uh, Connecticut Viewpoint, and they have shared some of the data. And this data is out of uh, News 21 staff, which was combined, uh, com uh, compiled at that time. Uh, from uh, 2000 to 2012, there were 196 cases, but in reality of those 196 cases, there were only 70, 70 cases that were related to uh, voter fraud. And if you put those numbers together, um, that were about of the 12 million votes that were casted, 70 were found to have some merit, and it's comes to 0.0006%, multiple factors less than what we saw in the rest of the country. The state of Connecticut in this end has been way better than the rest of the country, and the rest of the country is way better when the, what the perception is, is being propagated at times. Uh, this is something to look at. In other words, uh, oh, instead of 12, you're 55 times likely to be hit by lightning than to be involved in voter fraud, which is a pretty amazing statistic if, if you look at it. So this is uh, this myth is debunked from the data again uh, a concern that has been raised. Then do mail-in ballots increase participation? Yes, absolutely, and that would be what you would expect. So this is from the other states, but the mail-in uh, states actually have about a 10% better participation. We always complain uh, in private and public, and uh, that we don't have enough participation. We can actually improve that through this mechanism as well. What do people want in the community? And this is something worthy. This was a poll done in April 2020, Harvard uh, Harris uh, poll, which shows that 72% uh, uh, of our population in our community wants to do this by mail because they obviously are the ones who are worried about their health or their loved one's health, and they would want to actually have this done as well. So the overwhelming majority of our population wants this too. So this sort of, uh, as we are looking at a balance of what needs to be done, we are hoping that people can understand there is value in uh, what is being proposed. There's value on being protective of our citizens, our seniors, our young, uh, value in reducing the risk of uh, uh, a disease that can spread, which is already spread. We have seen its ugly face. We know what it can do to our community. It, we know what it's going to do to the economy, which is, it already has, and it's doing it across the country right now. We have a responsibility to make sure everybody can participate in the election. People who are eligible can be able to vote via mail and, and, and not have to worry about their personal health in the process. And that of our poll workers who are volunteers, who are seniors in our community and are 
uh, registrar of voters who are who have families where everybody is panicking and concerned about what could happen. So that's why looking at the data, looking at what we are talking about, looking at what is being proposed is worthy in the light of information and truth rather than concerns that are out there. With that, I wanted to just thank you for your attention. Hope everyone is well and please stay well.